Welcome to another session of our lecture on innovation management and marketing. Last time we stopped talking about marketing research and consumer behavior. And uh, we stopped dealing with the key questions that are of relevance and paramount importance when it comes to understanding the customers and the marketplace. Uh, first of all, um, a key question which is uh, listed on the slide, the first question might, might seem a little bit uh, too simple. We talked about that before, I think. Who's important? So it, it, it seems a bit like a dull, like a stupid question, but it's not a question, a stupid question. It's a very intelligent question because the question is here, not um, who's um, uh, the, the main decision maker, but the question is who is involved in the buying decision? Who is involved in the buying decision? And, and this is not only um, the purchaser. This is not only the, the, um, the people who make actually the purchase at the retail shop or online doesn't make any difference because the buying decision um, is comprised of several key players that have an influence. Of course, not when it comes to buying a chocolate bar or so, but um, in uh, we, we have a big differentiation in um, B2B and B2C marketing because in the, um, in the B2C marketing, B2C marketing, usually um, people are saying, okay, uh, a company is talking to the consumer and, uh, the, but, and the consumer is uh, making the final buying decision. And in, uh, in the B2B markets, B2B marketing, B2B marketing, uh, it is said that there is not a single buyer, but um, in B2B markets, we have a so-called buying center, a buying center, a buying center, or uh, it is also called DMU, decision-making unit, decision-making unit, de decision-making unit, a decision-making unit, because um, who's, who's involved in this buying center or in this buying process if a company buys from another company? Of course, you have people in the uh, contracting, uh, contracting and procurement, procurement, for example, the, the, uh, the people actually um, uh, initiating the uh, purchasing decision. Then you have people um, who sign off the deal, um, who, uh, who have the authority to do, to do that. Then you have people influencing the decision. And there are different kind of what we call stakeholders in these buying centers. Um, so you have um, different kind of roles, uh, a gatekeeper, an influencer, a decision maker, a user. For example, the people who later use the product, the users. For example, if Jaga sells to a hospital, who's, who's, the purchase, who's making the purchasing decisions? It's influenced by multiple people in the buying center because in this buying center are doctors, nurses, uh, the contracting procurement people of the hospital uh, and other people as well. Um, so multiple people having an impact on the buying decision. And this is the same basically, a little less complex, but it's, uh, it can be compared also in the B2, uh, B2C markets. Because if you have a high involvement product, and we talked about that before, what a high involvement product is, high involvement, and in high involvement product decisions, um, for example, if you buy a new kind of computer, if you buy a family car, if you um, go on vacation, book the family vacation, um, will be diff difficult this year, but <laughs> okay. Um, you have also a, 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 little, a little buying center because we talked about that. Um, people are influenced by other people when it comes to their buying decisions. We talked about that before. So um, when, when, come, when it came to the differentiation between um, high and low involvement, I'm not uh, going too far back now, but um, of course it makes sense that um, also in the B2C markets, there are multiple people who have an influence on, uh, on what you buy. For example, let's take a smartphone. You wanna buy yourself a new kind of smartphone, new kind of device. And uh, probably you're considering also shifting to uh, Android or going from Android to iOS, whatever, or to Google, um, to a Google phone, um, which is, of course, Android. But um, now, 
If you have no experience, you're reading test reviews, for example, or you're asking friends who already have a Samsung phone or who have a Google phone or have an Apple phone, whatever. Um, now, you're asking about what is, what is their experience with the phone. So also here, you have an influence of other people. So the question of who's important is a very intelligent question because we need to take into consideration when marketing to consumers who actually is influencing the consumer as well. Then um, the second, uh, second big question is, uh, what are the choice criteria? What are the choice criteria of, uh, of those kind of people? So is it about cost? Is it about, um, I don't know, cost value proposition? Is it about different kind of functions? Is it about, for example, a smartphone? Is it about the quality of the camera? Is it about the robustness? What are the choice criteria that play a role for certain kind of customer segments? Then, when do they buy? When actually um, are they purchasing products uh, online, offline? So that is also closely related to that kind of question. And how do they buy uh, online, offline, in retail? And uh, these are the questions that are of paramount importance. And uh, interestingly, um, when it comes to consumer behavior, we have uh, two kinds of um, models, basically. Um, we'll discuss that in a couple of, uh, couple of seconds. First of all, um, we need to understand or we, what we want to understand is how is the um, customer buying behavior look like? How does it look like? How, what kind of in influence factors do we have here? And um, the consumer buying behavior refers to the buying behavior of final consumers, individuals and households and organizations alike. So all those that have an influence, of course. And what do we have? We had, first of all, we have a stimulus uh, or different kind of stimuli going into the uh, buying decision because here you have the marketing mix, the four P's that play a role. Of course, if you're exposed to a product and you see certain kind of packaging or you uh, you're watching a commercial about a certain kind of product or company. Uh, but also what we need to understand is, of course, that there are other drivers, other influence factors um, having an impact on the buying decision, which is uh, basically here the uh, the pest analysis. I think we talked about that before. Um, we said this this one here, this is a strategic tool, basically, and it's called the pest analysis which is um, companies need to look at um, political, political, um, economic, uh, social and technological factors um, that influence technical factors that influence the buying decision, that influence the demand for a product or product category or a service in a certain kind of region. Um, I don't know, have we talked about, I, I forgot that, have we talked about the um, uh, the pest analysis, for example, or the uh, the issues and challenges that Drega had in uh, selling its anesthesia devices um, in in the Arab world? Did we talk about that or was it a different lecture? I, I, I don't remember, honestly, because I'm having lots of lectures. <laughs> Did we talk about the Drega example here? So, um, in how far, for example, social factors are influencing the uh, the buying decision as well. Oh, it was in management uh, and leadership, of course. Okay, um, but basically, you can uh, you can easily understand. I, I, I'm not going too much into details now, but um, social factors are, for example, religion, language, um, certain kind of attitudes, uh, um, lifestyle. Uh, values of society. All this is, of course, here, cultural things. Uh, this is influencing the buying decision as well. Um, then we have a, a black box because um, the, the buyer's decision process is not that obvious. What we can, what we can always observe is what is, the, uh, what is the environment? We can observe that. And we can also observe what the buyer's response is. So whether people are buying a product and how they are buying, how much they are buying or not. So we can, we can observe that. However, what we want to find out, uh, of course, is, and you know this from biology or physics or mathematics, um, 
these black box models there's there's a complex um process happening inside the um the mind of the consumer and we want to know of course how is this going along so early models of consumer buying behavior are sr models sr models therefore only look at what can be observed so what can be observed is the stimulus which is the four piece cultural factors and the uh, response so therefore they're called sr models the stimulus response models we can see the purchased products however what we want to find out of course is what is in the black box so huh, what is in the present here so how is the buying decision really comprised or which kind of elements have which kind of focus on the buying decision therefore we have uh, new more contemporary models of um, analysis of buying decision uh, making processes which is um, the sor models sor models are stimulus organism response models so in here we have still have the sr but what we what we are really interested in is this organism thing here right right so what is in the middle what is in the black box which is consumer characteristics so cultural social personal factors and psychology like attention involvement so what is the involvement of certain kind of product emotion motivation attitudes perception learning memory about past purchases right and the buying decision process problem recognition information search how is it happening uh we are not so much aware of that therefore um we we try to look in more depth into that uh to understand how the final purchasing decision and the behavior at the point of sale so at the retail or also online is uh is really happening and what uh, what causes that one we talked about that um, before uh, the factors influencing the consumer buying behavior. I was mentioning that already that we have this pest factors, political, economic, social, technological factors going in. So you have the cultural ones, social ones, personal ones, psychological ones. So all this is influencing, you see, all this is influencing us. All this is influencing the buyers. Um, so, for example, also and not only in the B2B, but also in the B2C markets because a family or reference group such as i don't know colleagues of yours right they have an influence on uh, on your buying decision or um it, and it also depends on on the role and status i have a nice uh, story in this respect um because um I, I don't know whether i was telling at the beginning of the lecture already about that so a couple of weeks ago but Nevertheless, I, I repeat that I was invited to give a speech with uh, my friend and mentor, Professor Kotler um, in, um, uh, in Myanmar. And also I was in uh, Pakistan and in India. Um, and I realized that uh, when I was in um, what, what, what was it? Myanmar? No, it was. Uh, I think it was Myanmar. Yes, it was Myanmar. And uh, in Myanmar, uh, what we realized was or what 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 came to my mind was there were there were a couple of managers top high very senior managers ceos of uh, of big corporations also self entrepreneurs and um they all were wearing the same kind of classic uh, mont blanc masterpiece uh fountain pens but interestingly um they were not wearing them in uh, i don't know in a leather case or i don't know inside the jacket or whatever but um, it was very unusual, uh, or, but they all had the same kind of thing. It was uh, worn by them outside of the uh, jacket in the in the pocket. So where I, for example, where I put my handkerchief, right? So they they had the Mont Blanc pen, and um, I was I was uh, asking one uh, one of the senior managers um, I, I knew uh, quite well. So I say, oh, why are you always wearing the pen outside of the pocket? Is it more convenient to get it out or or, or so uh, or, or so uh, or something like this? And he said, no, no, it is just to show my status to uh, the other senior managers here because um, it is just a sign of uh, of status. <laughs> I don't even have um, uh, the the um, the ink to write with it so it's it's basically it's empty so he's not actually not using it for writing it's just a status symbol here to to show and to demonstrate um that uh he's in a very very senior position in this uh in this kind of cooperation interestingly so um 
and th and this is what you cannot simply observe. You you can observe by and you can ask. And therefore, we need marketing and research because we want to understand uh, basically. So, what kind of, for example, in this instance here, what kind of social factors go in this uh, go in this buying decision? That is interesting. Ah, and that is the differentiation. I thought we talked about that before. Um, I uh, I don't know honestly because I thought I already mentioned that before the high and low involvement um, differentiation. But basically, what we are differentiating in marketing when it comes to uh, consumer behavior or also products, we differentiate between low involvement and high involvement purchasing decisions and also products. So if the involvement is rather low at the consumer end, there, uh, the need recognition and the problem awareness is more minor. So for example, if you buy a chocolate bar, right? Um, the involvement is very, very minor. Um, so you're not very much interested. You're not comparing different kind of um, chocolate bars and you're looking for price and you're looking for the ingredients. Okay, some people may do, but in general, people don't do that. But when it comes to high involvement decision making, um, for example, when purchasing a car, when purchasing a mobile phone, when purchasing a computer, when purchasing um, a suit, um, you compare different kind of models. You um, you uh, look at different kind of alternatives. You uh, you compare prices, or you go to the dealer and uh, take the car for a for a test ride, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here, it's much more important to you personally, right? So therefore, the information search by um, in the low involvement uh, decision making process is limited. Here is more extensive. So, uh, for example, if you purchase, uh, if, if the amount, the the purchasing amount is also higher. Usually, this calls for a more high involvement decision making process. For example, um, like I said, holiday, family holiday, where you pay probably thousand uh, or a couple of thousand of euros. Um, you're comparing different kind of hotels, you're comparing different kind of countries where to go to, etc., etc. different kind of uh, booking portals or whatever. Uh, whereas when you when you just, I don't know, want some kind of bread or toast or whatever, or sandwich, you just go to the supermarket and just pick one. Um, so it's limited search. Evaluation of alternatives of the purchase here, very few are evaluated because it's not re really uh, important. And here many alternatives are evaluated on multiple choice criteria. And that is interesting as well. After the purchase has been done here, there's limited evaluation. You just decide, okay, was it okay? Was it not okay? The product, so you taste it, for example, new kind of ice cream. You say, okay, it tastes great. Okay, you're going to buy it again. Uh, but in the high involvement, um, you try, of course, also afterwards to evaluate um, the um, the product, the brand. So, for example, if you bought yourself a new kind of car, uh, and you, you, even if you made the purchasing decision, you want to reassure yourself that you made the right uh, purchasing decision because uh, it was a lot of uh, money that was going into that. So there is an extensive evaluation. So even afterwards, you read a lot of tests and you try to always look for confirmation of your buying decision. So basically, the buying decision process is always looking the same. We have a need which we recognize. So we are hungry, we are thirsty or I don't know, my 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 shirt is, I don't know, broken and I need a new one or I need a formal one for a wedding or whatever. I don't know, I need a new tie or want a new tie. And then we we search the internet or we go to uh, go to shops and we ask friends, etc., etc., And we arrive at certain kind of uh, options we have, certain kind of models, certain kind of, I don't know, number of ties at different kind of dealers or retail shops. And then we make a purchasing decision. And afterwards, uh, of course, we want to be happy. And if we are happy, of course, we uh, we buy again at this kind of uh, shop. And this is how loyalty is being created. And that is, that is the um, overall strategy that Amazon is pursuing right now at the moment, um, because they are very much, like I mentioned before, um, trying to look for this uh, customer loyalty um, and uh, they want to build a loyal customer base here. I, I saw that there were some uh, kind of questions here. Um, what is it? I think there are also the function on consumer buying behavior. Yes. Demographic, psychographic, ethnographic. Are these um, 
what Habib is uh, writing in the chat, demographic, psychographic, ethnographic, chore choreographic. So some of them demographic, for example, these are um, criteria to divide um, a market. This is what we use in strategic management to divide a market, to segment a market. Psychographic, demographic, ethnographic. Uh, I'm not aware of ethnographic. We have an ethnocentric uh, attitude and ethnocentric means that um, you just focus on the home country and th th this is an international management term. Uh, ethnocentricity uh, is the belief that the practices that work best in the home country also work best abroad. So that is a, a global strategy that is pursued uh, sometimes by American, big American companies and they, they uh, want to internationalize. And then they try to apply the same kind of management principles, same kind of operations to another market. This is what we call an ethnocentric attitude, which is often uh, a bad decision because, uh, if, for example, you look at the uh, Walmart um, attempt to enter the German market, they completely messed it up. They completely failed because they built the big superstores here uh, and they thought it, it's about selection, it's about price, but the German customers were completely um, different and uh, Walmart had to uh, go out of the market again and they lost millions and millions of dollars. Now, um, with respect to high and low involvement uh, products uh, and buying decisions, we have two main purchasing models two main purchasing models, which is first one is the high involvement model. So which applies for high involvement purchasing decisions. Um, it's called the Fischbein Eisen model of reasoned action, reasoned action, reason action. So there's some reasoning behind because um, it is a high involvement decision. There is not, there are multiple reference groups and information that go and choice criteria that go into the uh, buying decision process. So it's not only the personal beliefs that forms attitudes towards a product, towards a service, towards a category, but also it is normative beliefs, subjective norms uh, of reference groups, friends, families, etc., that have an influence on the buying decision. So the purchase intention and the final purchase is influenced also by other factors than single individual factors. Uh, in the low involvement case, um, it's called the Ehren, uh, Ehrenberg Goodhart model and um, by, named by um, Ehrenberg and Goodhart. It is just awareness. So you're aware of a need, like we said, the need recognition. Then you try a product. Then you try, for example, a new kind of energy drink, right? And, and uh, you say, oh, normally I tried Red Bull, but now I give it a try. There's a new kind of uh, a drink coming from Monster. I try to give it a try. Okay, you try. It's low involvement. You, you're not, not interested in the price or whether it's, I don't know, 150 or 220. doesn't make any difference. And what happens, you try, if you like, you repurchase, right? You have a repeat purchase. So therefore, we, uh, we have an abbreviation and these are called ATR models. These are called ATR models. ATR models. Awareness, trial, reinforcement reinforcement or repeat purchasing so that is uh usually the case at the uh, at the low involvement thing now um there's a new kind of research um that's very much contemporary and the last um uh nobel prizes uh for um economics have been awarded um in the in the area of uh behavioristic studies so and how far um human behavior can be explained and what kind of psychological factors um, have an influence on uh, the buying decision and on the on the behavior of um, people in general so we have uh, all this um, we have that in finance for example it's called behavioral finance behavioral finance and how far is for example certain kind of um, decisions when it comes to purchasing uh, shares at the stock market and how far is it explained by psychological factors. And we have a, a, a new discipline in, in, in marketing as well, which is called uh, neuro uh, marketing. Neuro marketing, it's a kind of a new discipline which is getting input from neurobiology, from uh, biology, from med uh, medical uh, surgery, um, the study of the brain 
The study of the brain is very, very important um, because it better helps us to understand how purchasing decisions, how certain kind of um, attitudes uh, and appreciations for a person, for a political party, for a product, for a service uh, can be explained. So uh, what is interesting is, uh, for example, if you do a brain scan, if you uh, do a functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, and you have here um, two brains uh, being compared to each other. So one, one, br one brain is exposed or has been exposed uh, to a strong brand. Another one has been exposed to a rather weak brand from the consumer perspective. It's very interesting to, to, to look at that because normally we could assume that it should be the other way around, that it should be, uh, it should be vice, vice versa, but it's not. So did I make a mistake? Should it be this one? Should it be changed? Why is the strong brand is strong, but why is the strong brand causing very, very, very few turbulence, very few activities in the, uh, in the human brain? Do you have any, any kind of reasoning for that? What do you think? So why is, why is the, um, why is the, uh, the strong brand causing less activity than, uh, than the weak brand? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody has any, any opinion? What do you think? Why, why is the weak brand causing that much activity here? Because activity is a good thing, isn't it? Well, we thought a strong brand is better than a weak brand and therefore it should be more activity. Or What, what, what is the issue here? No. Okay. No. Nobody has any any kind of uh, opinion about that. You feel more safe. That's a very good one, uh, Sandra. Um, because what a, a strong brand is. We said what is a brand. We said a brand is a collection of perceptions in the hearts and minds of the customer. So if uh, you have a brand, you know, um, and you're using regularly, right? Um, you know what to get. You know what if you purchase it again. Uh, you, you, you know about the quality, you know about the price quality uh, positioning, right? It's already known to the brain beforehand, correct? So um, you know what, what you get and a weak brand, you wonder about the quality. You wonder about, I don't know, price quality relation. Is it a good deal? Is it not a, a good deal? So there's a lot of activity going on and, and strong brands, simply speaking, they give you an ease, a peace of mind because uh, you have a very distinct image about about the brand that is interesting uh to look at uh, to look at uh what we also uh look at is uh, now next picture here yeah now we do a little bit of uh, attractiveness research and you might wonder okay what does it have to do with uh marketing what does it have to do with market uh, market research just look at the uh, three uh, uh pictures of the uh, the woman of course, they are Photoshop, but um, don't look uh, for differences, but just spontaneously tell me uh, A, B, C, or one, two, three, which one is the most attractive in your opinion? Don't, don't look for differences, just spontaneously type in the chat and just give a little bit of feedback, uh, which, which you think, yeah, the two, okay, Tamara, two, two, two. Interesting, uh, most, of, most of you are, are choosing number two. Now, why is that interesting? And, and you may think, ah, oh, what, is, what is Professor Presnick here telling me about? Because uh, he's getting this from, I don't know, a gentleman's magazine or some, some stupid yellow press, uh, yellow press paper. But actually, that is, a, um, that is research done by a Nobel Prize uh, winner, Daniel Kahneman. Um, and Daniel Kahneman is the Nobel Prize winner for economics. And um, this is his research. And now the middle one is, in, in fact, I'm not saying it's a correct answer <laughs> because, uh, but the interesting thing is what makes us go for the middle one or more than 70%, more than 70% go for B. Why? Uh, because B has the perfect, uh, the Photoshop, best Photoshop, <laughs> waist to hip ratio, the, the proportion between the waist and the hip. The waist to hip ratio, it is a key 
indicator for uh, attractiveness, by the way, across cultures. Therefore, uh, and, and uh, Kahneman and, uh, and uh, his colleagues, they were showing it to, uh, to multiple um, people around the world and more than 70% went for B. When being asked, why do you go for B? People say, I don't know, probably um, ah, the hair is a bit different. So we try to rationalize, we try to understand what made us go for B. Now, why is that interesting? It is interesting now because the um, what made us go for B or the majority go for B is not obvious to us. We think, uh, I don't know, this is because we try to rationalize, but it's not obvious because we are not aware of this waist to hip ratio. It's an implicit criteria which is entering the selection process. So, and this led to, uh, to enormous uh, consequences, um, very, very interesting uh, consequences that uh, Kahneman was uh, suggesting. In every second, um, the autopilot in our brain, so our brain is uh, basically, it's run by two kinds of pilots. One is the autopilot and the autopilot is able to gather via the five senses 11 million bits of information in one second in one second so in one second you can read about 60,000 pages of a book so 1.4 megabytes roughly now you may say ah oh, this is nonsense i cannot read 60,000 pages in one second but yes you can you can and you do that but you do it on a subliminal basis uh, consciously explicitly we are only able to gather 40 bits of information per second so the, which is a sentence uh so the 40 bits is a sentence of seven words so we can only gather seven words per second consciously however whether we wish it or we don't wish it to happen we are automatically gathering 11 million bits of information therefore as a consequence we uh we have the uh, the brand signals here so these are the these are the marketing stimuli and we have culture, cultural influences, reference group, etc., etc., etc. But um, the autopilot, which is the so-called implicit effect, the implicit effect, this effect is not obvious to us, is making up 90 to 95 percent of our decisions. Not only purchasing decisions, but but in general decisions, decisions whether we like a person, whether I don't know, we're going for this kind of colored computer or that kind of color, uh, colored suit or tie or whatever. Um, we, are, we are not aware of that, but this is actually what is happening. And here, the, uh, the explicit effect, the explicit effect, we're always thinking uh, of ourselves being homo economicus. And, and there's um, a saying that, uh, and, and this is an old one, that we are all rational and we compare different kind of, I don't know, cars and computers um, in order to, uh, to, to arrive at a good buying decision. But however, we are not that logical as we think we are. And that is, like I said, please uh, read the book from, 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 uh, from Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman. For example, um, his award winning book, Thinking uh, Fast, Thinking Slow. You have to, uh, to look for that. Thinking fast, thinking slow. Um, probably you have heard about that before. It is uh, an award-winning book by, uh, by Daniel Kahneman and uh, very, very interesting to read. Uh, Kahneman uh, it, uh, is at the top of uh, the research when it comes to uh, behavior, human behavior. It's not only relevant for marketing, but it's relevant for all kinds of decision-making and brain studies. I would have had nice, very, very nice uh, videos to show to you, but um, for uh, intellectual property uh, reasons, we cannot do that. So we cannot uh, cannot show the videos, unfortunately. Um, okay, let's uh, go to the next chapter, which is uh, marketing mix. We talked about that before, of course, because it's a marketing lecture. We said that marketing is comprised of uh, different kind of tools, different kind of elements, basically, here the four P's. We have the four P's: promotion, place, price, and product. And what you strive for as a marketeer or as an enterprise is to have a very good balance, to have a good mix of those instruments, to combine them in such a way that uh, 
you have maximum output that you have maximum success of course however i i said uh, you have to balance that for example look at uh, just look at place and price if you sell uh, expensive watches for example and you sell them at uh, at supermarkets it doesn't it doesn't add up right this is not a sophisticated marketing mix so what i mean by by that is and it becomes crystal clear that the positioning of your product of your brand here the positioning of the brand of the product has to be in line has to be consistent and coherent across the marketing mix so you have to reflect that also in distribution and uh, and vice versa and basically these are the uh, the tasks that uh, the operational marketing mix is about so we think about product so product is the starting point it's, num uh, it's the first thing you do of course because if you don't have any product if you don't have any kind of service there's nothing to market and in the product mix uh, you you not only have to think about the product quality uh, but moreover you have to think about the program so how many different kind of product products do you need so how many different lines of products or lines of businesses do you need the lobs lines of businesses so and how far are you going into breadth and how far are you going into depth so how many different variants of products do you need and that is a very very intelligent question um, do you need I don't know 10 smartphones do you need 100 do you need 50 do you need one yeah that is the question um, brand how are you building a strong brand how can you build a brand that sticks in the hearts and minds of the customers and we talked about that that this is a very very um, um, key point here which is of paramount importance because the brand is actually something you cannot easily copy services of course uh, also belong to product and we call that um, value added services so um, value added services could be bundled uh, with the product value added services value added services they could be bundled with a product so for example you you're selling in order to different to differentiate from competition you're selling ah I'm, I'm not selling solely computer but if you buy a computer with me so whether you're a store or a manufacturer it doesn't make, make any difference um you're getting i don't know uh, a, a 24 7 hotline you can always call us also at night and and we replace the computer or we have telephone support or or whatever or um just think about uh think about zip zippo you know zippo you know zippo the lighters um for example they have lifelong warranty they say if you buy a lighter with zippo so dupont is much more expensive by but zippo gives you lifelong warranty so if it's broken after 37 years you can send it to zippo you get a new one uh, so that is also kind of a service which is coming along with the product which is also influencing the perception of the brand price you have to think about the price huh. that, that is of course clear but now it's not that easy because uh, you know about your cost but you don't know about what is customer uh, what is customer willing to buy uh, so how much is he is he able or willing to pay for a certain kind of product so what is the maximum uh, for example and should you charge the same price all over the world or should you charge different prices with respect to the region should you charge different prices with respect to the customer so are you selling an iPhone to students for uh, another price then you're selling to senior people then you're selling to normal people are you I don't know selling uh, an iPhone in Italy um, for the same price as you're selling in uh, in Spain as you're selling in I don't know China so that is of course a strategy you need to uh, you need to reflect upon credits uh, rebates discounts all these are uh, questions here please you need to think about channels you need to think about of course are you selling directly are you selling indirectly are you selling via retail or are you um, making up your own retail outlets usually brands or strong brands big brands such as Nike or Montblanc they're doing both so they have what we call a multi-channel distribution a multi-channel distribution what is a multi-channel distribution a multi-channel distribution is if you are selling multi-channel distribution is if you if you're selling your product uh, to 
or through different kind of channels, right? So you're selling through retail, you're selling through your own outlets, but also uh, you're selling online. Uh, and that is multi-channel. That is what uh, a lot of brands have. Then you need to think about, uh, of course, uh, the distribution. So how are you getting the products from A to B or to from the storage or from the factory towards retail and towards the customer. And the big one is, of course, also the promotional mix, because the promotional mix also, and for example, in particular, uh, social media, it has a strong influence on the brand. It has a strong influence on the brand. Um, and of course, on how also on how the uh, product quality is perceived uh, by the uh, by the customer, right? So this is about telling others, so customers, stakeholders about your product via advertising, via using billboards, print, radio, TV, uh, social media, and what is very very complicated is you need to decide if you have a certain kind of budget being allocated. You need to decide how do you split up the budget. How much money am I spending on social media? How much, how much money, we, even within social media, how much money am I spending on YouTube? How much money am I spending on Facebook? How much money am I spending on TikTok or Instagram, whatever? And that is very, very complicated. And um, so I'm not talking about the creative part. I'm just talking about uh, right using the right channels here. Promotion. So sales promotions can be also dealer promotions. We'll talk about that. And here you can see again, why marketing is not only relevant. It's not only relevant for people or companies who want to sell something because marketing also a big element of marketing communication is public relations, public relations, PR. And therefore you see, everybody needs PR. Everybody needs public relations. Look at governments, right? The German government needs public relations or Catholic church, right? Government of China, government of Russia, every government on the planet and political parties, they need public relations as well. Public relations is not selling a product. Public relations is not telling others about your product. Public relations is about managing the relationships via ways of communication. Yeah. Through. Through different through different kind of channels, right? But in order to uh, signal or to to uh, to build an image of your of your company of your corporation, but it's not so much in, uh, in the first place to sell more products. And then you have personal selling, which is another big element here in the promotional mix, which is happening, for example, during trade shows. So you can see that also or only the operational part. There. So this is not marketing strategy. This is only the operational mar uh, marketing mix here is already very, 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 very complex. And so a lot of tools, like I said, for example, we can we can just have, a, a, I don't know, we're talking 100 hours just about branding, how to build brands, right? So let's get started. Let's get uh, started with the operational mix and we start with the promotion. Unfortunately, uh, due to legal reasons, we cannot show on in class. I would have shown now multiple videos giving you um, certain kind of commotion, uh, commercials, which we will discuss. This is unfortunately not the case. We cannot do that. Or we, even if I embed that, that's a kind of a problem because it's filtered out. And so we have to, um, uh, to, uh, to forget about that. Nevertheless, um, let's, uh, let's get started. Promotion mix is the specific blend of advertising, public relations, personal selling and direct marketing that the company uses to persuasively so try to persuade the customer that um, you're having a good service, you're having a good qual uh, quality, you're having a good product, right? Um, but also the, uh, the greater public. So we see that here, like I was mentioning before, advertising, person selling, public relations, direct marketing and the sales promotion. A very key differentiation uh, in uh, communication in general is the distinction between ADL and BDL communication. ATL communication is I, uh, above the line communication. So it's like a ship. If you um, imagine water and you, uh, you have a ship or uh, being in the water, it's not a ni nice ship, but everything that is above the line, above the water is, is the classical forms of communication. So billboards, TV commercials, radio, print ads, uh, all the classic media channels, such as, like I said, TV, papers, cinema, magazines. Below the line is all the non-classical parts of communication. So which is mainly in today's world, social media, but also 
uh, telephone, uh, telephone marketing or mailing. Now, what is advertisement? What is advertisement as uh, the first pillar uh, within the communication mix? Advertisement and advertising is any paid form of uh, non-personal presentation and promotion of ideas, goods or services by a certain kind of company or organization. It is a tool used by intention because you want to achieve something, you want to sell more or you want to um, build a brand, you want to get recognized by, uh, by companies. So it is a tool um, which is used by intention to influence people. Of course, you cannot force people. You cannot uh, force people, even though brains research has been uh, progressing, uh, but there is no buy button. Even in the subconscious mind of the consumer, there's no buy button which you can push and then customers are always buying your product. Thankfully, there is no buy button. So it's unforced. However, it's persuasive. It's persuasive and it's always target oriented. You want to establish a relationship. You want to build your brand. You want to sell more products. You want to increase profitability. But what is the main challenge? I love that slide. Um, I just did it uh, beginning of this year. It is a, a very, very cool slide that shows, and it can be done for any product. It can be done for bicycles. It can be done for ties. It can be done for computers. It can be done for iPads. It can be done for uh, all products, for even for anesthesia devices or solar plants. The, pro uh, the problem is that products and services are increasingly becoming homogeneous. So they look alike. They feel alike. They taste alike. So it's about food, everything. Just if you look at the, uh, the, the helmets here for hiking, biking, uh, they're all resembling each other. Okay, they're a bit different in color, but, but even if, you, if this, this, uh, this uh, sparing's here, they're all, they're all similar. And what is more, uh, more of a problem even is if you look at the most popular ones here, which I did, they all have the same kind of quality. They're all tested the same they're all tested the same. so there's no superior one there may be some helmets which are slightly better which are more expensive or less expensive doesn't make any difference but the, the problem for uh, for the com companies is that the products and services they are more and more homogeneous which makes it more difficult to stand out and there is a very very nice image uh, we can talk about in this respect it's uh, it's a metaphor uh, I think I was telling uh, that in management and leadership uh, already, but here in marketing makes sense as well. It's an image of um, of penguins. Did I give you the uh, analogy of the penguins on the ice shelf already in the course here in the in the uh, marketing course? I don't know, but there are penguins uh, on an ice shelf, and uh, they are resembling, of course, an analogy for companies or organizations. And they're all hungry for fish, but they're a bit, bit anxious because they don't know whether there are killer waves around. They don't know whether there are killer waves around and they're a bit anxious to jump into the water because if they jump into the water first, they may get the best fish, but they may be killed by orcas. So one company, one penguin is so courageous, he jumps into the water first. What are the others doing? Nobody's following. Huh, they are looking what is happening. If he's getting the best fish, what is happening? All the others are following. That is a lovely image for innovation as well, because we're talking about innovation, management and marketing. Um, that is a lovely image for innovation. The first phase is called penguin phase. Penguin phase. This is the phase where the penguins are on the ice shelf and they're all hungry for fish and they're hesitant to jump into the water. The penguin jumps into the water first, for example, comes out with an innovation. Uh, let's assume there's an orca, right? And he said, oh, nice, penguin. Yeah, he eats the penguin. The water turns red. What, what is happening to this? Nobody's falling, of course, because they might be killed. They are afraid. So this is if an innovation is not successful. The second phase is called fast selling item phase. So if an innovation is successful, people are copying it in an ever shorter period amount of time. They're copying your product and uh, an innovation soon becomes a commodity. Therefore, we need this communication. Therefore, we need sophisticated communication in order to stand out of the clutter. The problem is that uh, additionally, saturated markets impede effective differentiation, making brand communication a key success factor. Because just look at that. I, I took it uh, at a um, superstore here. 
it's a picture uh, uh, taken uh, from uh, from Walmart superstore or some big supermarket um, and you see that we have an oversupply uh, of products so we have um, not a selling market where sellers dominate the markets but we have a buyer market so we have more products than we can ever consume we have hundreds of different uh, different sorts of marmalade of of uh, of uh, honey of whatever <laughs> chocolate uh, <laughs> cookies and everything like that how can you stand out of the clutter how can you stick out how can you differentiate from your competitors it is very difficult it is very very difficult uh, basically you can only do through effective communication and function wise you can only stand out of the clutter if you have a strong brand which uh, represent which which has a higher motive so which has a lot of emotional attachments coming uh, coming along with it and or you have a strong and loyal customer base so the customers are happy with your service and they're buying over and over again this is what uh, like I said what the strategy of Alibaba or Amazon is like sales promotion is a short-term incentive to encourage sales uh, to encourage turnover that is for example happening if uh, something is uh, on sale for example and um, the companies are advertising that that blue jeans is on sale now Levi, Levi's 501 whatever uh, and you get a discount or you have um, what McDonald's for example and other fast food uh, retailers uh, and restaurants are using uh, they are playing a lot with the coupons that you have a coupon like uh, I don't know uh, uh, buy one get second one free or second one fifty percent off and they have uh, sometimes displays in the uh, supermarkets for example uh, that they're displaying how a product or a certain kind of service or an instrument works and they have uh, demonstrations coming along with that and direct marketing is if you like like I mentioned before if you directly sell to the consumer uh, it is still it is still relevant um, this uh, telephone marketing for example is working very well and also what is working very well is uh, television uh, home shopping is working very very well uh, so this is uh, for example also comprised in the telemarketing here so any form of direct mail telephone direct response television email and the internet to communicate directly with specific customers so not to have a radio commercial but if you really communicate directly with a specific customer so that is direct marketing Personal selling, I mentioned before, um, is the personal presentation of a company's sales force for the purpose of increasing sales, for um, making people uh, appreciate a new kind of innovation, new kind of product, a new kind of service, etc., etc., etc. So this is uh, what we sub, uh, what we sum sum up uh, being uh, personal selling. So it can happen during sales presentations, trade shows, like shown here also in kind of incentive programs uh, that are, are coming along with the uh, that are initiated by the company so the goal of uh, personal selling is to get not only new customers but also to uh, to make customers turn into loyal customers so to increase loyalty uh, and satisfaction for your company's products and services so sales morale and performance can be increased through and that is of course important that you that you have people being really passionate for selling something or for for talking to a customer for interacting with them um, and it can be increased through organizational climate sales quotas for example if you have certain kind of goals and also incentives uh, here that uh, if you uh, some some sales staff I don't know is increasing sales or turnover by 10% get a bonus um, and uh, the sales competition are very very effective in uh, in real life Another thing, uh, like I mentioned before, which is uh, very interesting, very, very interesting, and we can talk, uh, just we can talk one year about public relations, is uh, the PR. Uh, PR involves building good relations, not only with the customers, not only with the customers, but with all stakeholders of the organizations. And stakeholders are interest groups of the uh, organization, such as media, such as i don't know lobby groups uh, greenpeace human rights watch attack um, etc the works council uh, the suppliers competitors etc so public relations provides acceptance for the organization uh, but what what is the most important thing is here uh, it's it's written down here 
building a global identity uh, but not not so much to increase sales uh, um, in uh, in the first place um, it is more to build an image of the company and identity what the company stands for so what shall what shall Google be representing to the outside world, not only to the customers using Google, but also to governments, to media, etc., etc. So um, that is public relations. One of the best PR campaigns of all times uh, is coming from uh, a former competitor of, uh, of Shell. Uh, I'm still a competitor, but not. Uh, I'm not working for Shell anymore. So, but uh, it's coming from BP, British Petroleum. So uh, BP decided to. Uh, to give itself a new name a couple of years uh, years ago i think dates back i don't know 20 years or i, I forgot about uh, when it, when it actually happened but they said we want to move away from british petroleum towards what they call beyond petroleum <laughs> that is a masterpiece that is a masterpiece of communication why is that a masterpiece because they said it's about diversity instead of just focusing on one product because um, people are associating BP, such as Shell and Exxon, with oil. But uh, BP is saying, oh, we, of course we are doing oil. However, we also care about gas, wind, solar, bio, uh, bio uh, technology and, and energy efficiency, right? And they, uh, they gave itself a new logo, which is this, this flower here, this green flower. Now, what is so interesting about this campaign was that um, BP didn't really substantially invest more into um, into solar, into biotechnology when the campaign was being launched. But the, the company was suddenly perceived as one of the greenest companies on the planet, really uh, one of the greenest companies on the planet. They, people were saying also the normal car drivers, they were saying, oh, BP, they're much more uh, an, um, uh, environmental friendly and they're much more concerned about the environment. And uh, we were a little bit jealous of Shell and Aral and all the competitors. They were a bit jealous because BP suddenly, just with this claim beyond petroleum, and uh, they, they positioned the brand differently in the hearts and minds, in the hearts and minds of the, the, the customers. That is not to blame BP. That is just to show that, of course, uh, in particular in, uh, in public relations, a carefully established uh, reputation can be tarnished, can be destroyed. Sorry, that's a typo here. Um, can be destroyed very, very quickly in a short period amount of time. It just if you look at the deep water horizon, it happened to us. Well, we had the uh, um, the brand spa incident and BP had the deep water horizon. And um, when the deep water horizon accident happened in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, actually, it was not really BP's fault because it was a contractor and there were uh, some safety issues there um, but the problem was that um, it was perceived to be solely the fault of bp and the very very bad press very bad reputation was uh, was a result before they were perceived as being very uh, much environmental friendly and concerned and uh, looking for sustainability it is very complicated and now you can see what i mean here um, the tarnished reputation of the company is not caused by the catastrophe itself, but more by the inadequate communication and the perception of the stakeholders which surround it. So the broad public which surround PP. Um, this is Tony Hayward and Tony Hayward was the CEO to BP during those days. And he was doing an excellent job for BP. He was doing an excellent job for BP and um, BP was a very successful company and still is. Um, but the problem was after the incident happened in the Gulf of Mexico, um, Tony Hayward was working all day long. He was working as a crisis manager to get the crisis fixed. So to, to handle the crisis. However, what happened a couple of weeks later, you can see, uh, you can see also when, when the uh, accident happened 2010, so uh, 10 years ago, um, he was filmed when he was sailing with his uh, expensive yacht around the Channel Islands, uh, here it says Tony Hayward in another PR disaster. What was he doing? He was sailing with his yacht a couple of weeks after the, uh, the incident happened in the Gulf of Mexico. He was sailing on a Sunday afternoon with his yacht. 
Um, and this was filmed and this was uh, contrasted. This image of Tony Hayward with his yacht uh, was contrasted to the image of um, dead birds, um, people cleaning uh, the beaches um, at the Gulf of Mexico and women crying and, and men crying because nobody's visiting the restaurants anymore, etc., etc., etc. So I'm saying here is public relations key, a key tool in um, building a reputation, which is also impacting the brand. And um, it would have been good uh, if Tony Hayward, for example, would have jumped into a helicopter or into a private plane to, to go to the Gulf of Mexico and help clean the beaches than to just sit in London um, because he was perceived as being sailing. The same happened, interestingly, the same happened to President Obama because Obama was playing golf, not when the incident happened, but he was playing golf uh, a couple of weeks later uh, with Joe Biden. Um, the vice president with, with his uh, vice president, who was playing uh, a game of golf. And there was an official note in the House of Congress here uh, in the Republican National Committee. Chairman Michael Steele demanded President Obama to stop leisure activities, to stop playing golf until the crisis in the Gulf of Mexico is finally resolved. So it says here until the problem is fixed. No more golf outings, no more baseball games, no more Beatle concerts, Mr. President. The stakes are too high for the President Obama. Like a day signal approach to both his responsibilities and the challenges we face. Interestingly, uh, so he had the same kind of issue that um, that um, Tony Hayward was facing. So that is uh, a little bit to, to just to demonstrate how complicated and uh, it is really to do sophisticated public relations. But if you do it in a very, very good and sophisticated way, um, your company or organization or yourself as a person might come out stronger, might emerge stronger. And that is what we see in particular in today's world. Uh, if you look at uh, Corona, for example, and what some politicians are doing or not doing, how they're communicating and how they are perceived because they are also brands. They are also brands in an abstract way. Macron is a brand, such as France is a brand, Germany is a brand, Angela Merkel is a brand, right? Zöder is a brand. So, um, and of course they are perceived by their actions and what they communicate and how they communicate. Therefore, we see that public relations is a big part in, uh, in marketing. And in the end, um, the uh, the boss uh, of BP had to had to had to leave the corporation. He had to resign, although he was doing a good job. But suddenly, uh, lobby groups such as BP, uh, just, uh, sorry, just as Greenpeace, they were coming out um, from behind and saying, "Okay, BP is not so much about British petroleum. It's not so much about beyond petroleum. It's about broken promises, back to black. Vote for the new face of BP." And they were really bashing the company. They are try. Uh, they were. I'm sorry. I'm going back. Um, they were highlighting the sites where BP is in London, and they say don't go there, and uh, because they are um, they are killing birds and they are doing nothing, etc., etc. And uh, Tony had to leave the company, although he was doing a great job, although he was really maximizing shareholder value uh, and was uh, really managing well, but the the broad public perceived Tony Hayward as not being a sophisticated crisis manager. Okay. So before we continue with sponsoring, because sponsoring is quite uh, an interesting thing. And I like to talk a little bit about uh, sports sponsoring. I like to talk a little bit in this respect about James Bond and, uh, and placement in movies and also in games. Uh, it's a very, very big, uh, very, very big topic. So I end the recording here. Thanks very much for your attention. And uh, I see you for another session. Of course, I stay in the line for your questions and uh, any kind of feedback. But I end the recording here. Thanks very much. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.